Now, I used to be a philosopher, and Dimitris, who is Greek, is very keen on philosophy because <laughs> it, it started in Greece. Um, but I am actually much more interested in applied ontology. But for Dimitris' sake, I will say a little bit about the, uh, the Greek background of applied ontology. So ontologies are being used in all kinds of areas uh, as a result of the fact that in all kinds of areas we have huge amounts of data which come from heterogeneous sources. And the main idea behind ontology is that we create common vocabularies which are logically well defined which can be used to tag data coming from different sources so that the data becomes integrated. The sources become interoperable. So the BBC is one example, the New York Times is another example. Um, the Siri in your iPhone is probably the most successful example. So Tom Gruber, who was the inventor or the leader of the team which invented Siri, was also one of the initial protagonists of applied ontology and Siri is based on a series of small ontologies which grow constantly as more and more people use Siri and the ontologies are controlled vocabularies for describing things like restaurants or movies or traffic uh, and so on. Now all of this started with Aristotle roughly speaking uh, and the metaphysics, which just means the lectures he gave after the physics, um, is the first contribution that we have to what we call ontology today. Aristotle was also the first practitioner of what nowadays can be viewed as empirical biology, and also he created the first database. So his constitution of Athens survives, but he actually created a database of 158 constitutions. He forgot to back up his data. <laughs> um, but we know what the ontology of Aristotle's database of constitutions looked like. Uh, so there are royalty-based, aristocracy-based, and constitutional government-based uh, constitutions. And Aristotle developed a classification of these constitutions uh, in some detail. And we can reconstruct this classification from those of his, I won't say works, but the lecture notes from his students which survive. So this is the fundamental hierarchy underlying, underlying Aristotle's categories. Uh, there are substances, which means objects, things, uh, which are either material or immaterial. Material substances are bodies. Some bodies are animate. Uh, they're called living bodies. Some living bodies are sensitive. This is Aristotle now. Uh, they're called animals. Some animals are rational and they're called humans. And then we have instances of human, all of whom are Greek. <laughs> um, so this is in, Aristotle himself didn't do diagrams, but the Porf Porphyry created, not this diagram, but a diagram anyway, uh, in his commentary on Aristotle's categories. And this is, this is the um, prototype for ontologies today, which are fundamentally graph hierarchies. Now Linnaeus took over from Aristotle the idea of a graph hierarchy and created not just a taxonomy of organisms, but a taxonomy of diseases and so forth. So Linnaeus was the first applied ontologist <coughs> in the Aristotelian tradition. And then ontology died, more or less. There were some philosophers writing in Latin, primarily, um, who, was, who were still working on ontology in roughly the Aristotelian vein, but that with, with Descartes and Kant, the ontological focus of philosophy was replaced with an epistemological focus. They were interested in knowledge, not in being. But in, in the 1950s, an American philosopher, and this is the last time I will talk about philosophy, called Quine, introduced the idea of what he called ontological commitment. And what this means is, working out 
for a scientific theory what that scientific theory is committed to. For instance, electrons or colors or beliefs. And he, he put forward a methodology for determining what has to exist if that scientific theory is to be true. Now that idea was taken up by computer scientists, particularly John McCarthy and Pat, Pat Hayes, in the 1970s, working on robotics and on logic-based artificial intelligence. So they had the idea that Quine's theory of ontological commitment can be applied not just to sciences, scientific theories, but also to human common sense or naive physics, or naive biology, or naive um, uh, psychology. And so now the question is, what would a robot have to believe in in order to simulate human common sense? And the classic example is, you're trying to build a robot who can buy salad. So the robot has to know about buildings, doors, tables, chairs, salad bars, salad tongues, tomatoes, people, politeness, money, um, walking, lifting, squeezing, so the, you can't crush the tomato when you pick it with the tongue. And that's a very, very complicated body of knowledge. And Pat Hayes created uh, formal ontology in the modern sense uh, with his colleagues uh, in the McCarthy uh, school by trying to axiomatize human common sense knowledge about tomatoes and rivers and pudding and so forth. Um, and there arose then a discipline called qualitative physics which tried to do qualitative calculations about moving salad or buying salad or lifting salad. Now, this development was um, much too early. So they were trying to do very, very complicated logic at a time when computer capacity to deal with very large axiom systems was much weaker than it is today. And they were using first-order logic, which is in any case not tractable for large-scale computational purposes. Uh, but the ideas that they developed, they, they survived uh, and gradually they became modern day semantic web technology. So there's a, a direct line from uh, McCarthy and co to Gruber and the IBM Watson and Siri and so forth. And all of this was then codified in a project called the DAML, De DARPA Agent Markup Language. Another project called OIL, DAML, OIL, conf I, I said confused there nearly, became fused together to create OWL, which is the web ontology language, which is the basis for the semantic web, which is the de facto standard language for building ontologies. Um, I, I still believe that there is a, a worthwhile <coughs> basis for thinking that good ontologies need more expressivity than OWL. So I still use first order logic as well as using OWL. Uh, there is a standardization of first order logic called common logic, uh, which if you're interested in ontologies you should know about. Uh, but OWL is the de facto standard. Most people building ontologies use Owl. All right, now independently of all of that, ha having no influence at all from the computer science world, from AI, from um, uh, the, 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 the qualitative physics, or any of those developments, a group of biologists in 1998 um, founded something called the gene ontology. Now they called it an ontology not because they knew what an ontology was. 
in a way no one knew at that stage. They called it an ontology as, as a kind of joke or a, as a way of doing this to the computer scientists. They created ontology all for themselves. And the gene ontology was in its day, and still today, incredibly influential. It was very successful. And it led to other ontologies, the cell ontology, the protein ontology. And it led also to basic formal ontology, which we will learn more about in a minute. Um, so I, I, I belong more to this tradition than to the Patrick Hayes, Quine, McCarthy, Gruber tradition. Um, I, I am actually one of the few people who, in a way, combines both of those traditions. But that's a long story, a sad story. <laughs> OK, so why was the gene ontology so successful? This is old biology. It's made up of Latin words, basically, with a few English words. And it's made up of a view of reality which looks rather like this. And this is new biology. <clears throat> this is the human genome, or a bit of it. Now the question is, how do you do biology when your data looks like this? And how do you link these kinds of phenomena to these kinds of data? That is the problem of biology since 1998, when the human genome and the fly genome and the mouse genome were decoded. And the gene ontology was the solution to that problem. The gene ontology is not an ontology of genes. It's an ontology of biology to be used to annotate or tag genomic data. So this is the gene ontology. It's a species-neutral vocabulary for describing attributes of gene sequences, protein sequences, and so forth. And this is a small fragment. It's a graph. It now has about 40,000 nodes. And the nodes are things like biological process, multicellular organismal process, single multicellular organismal process, and so on. Uh, so these are biology words, old biology words, cardiac muscle development, death cell division, perception of blue light, and so on. These are all terms in English, or Latin English, which are used to do biology, but which are also used to tag sequence data. And there has been an investment of, of the order of $300 million in tagging sequence data and tagging literature about sequence data using the GO. So this, the result is the Gene Ontology Annotation Database. And it's a, a, a principal source of biological and now medical data for people doing research using genomic and proteomic and other omics data. So here, the edges are relations such as subtype of, part of, regulates, and so on. And all the terms in the Go have a, a logical definition which the computer can reason with, in principle, at least. And the gene ontology is species neutral. So it's used to tag gene sequence data, not just about human uh, beings, but about mice, flies, yeast, and so forth. And so it's a kind of international standard for describing genomic and proteomic data across species, across disciplines, across biological interests. So if you're interested in aging, you use the gene ontology. If you're interested in uh, cell biology, you, you use the gene ontology, and so forth. And that's why it's so influential. That's why it's so important. Now, the gene ontology covers three kinds of entities. Cellular components, molecular functions, and biological processes. It doesn't cover other things. And there was an attempt already from the very beginning to extend the gene ontology, which is the yellow here, 
to cover other kinds of biological phenomena. And I became involved with the gene ontology. In fact, this diagram was created by me at a very early stage when we were trying to build a suite of ontologies which would cover biological medical data. Uh, the slides that I will make available uh, later on, if you're interested in what's going on here. Um, a suite of ontologies which would cover all of the relevant domains within biology in a non-redundant way. Now, this is crucially important. The, the big problem with ontologies today is not the lack of Greek philosophy. The big problem is that there are too many bad ontologies. There are 17 ontologies for every little thing. And we need exactly one mm -hmm. ontology for every little thing. And that's very hard to do. That's a gigantic sociological problem. People think everyone should have their own ontology, but that defeats the very purpose of ontology, which is to link heterogeneous data rather than to create yet more silos. All right, so we wrote a paper on the Oboe Foundry, which has also been very influential. And um, this led to more and more people wanting to join the Oboe Foundry to follow the methodology of Oboe Foundry. We have a peer review methodology, which I will describe at the very end <coughs> if we have time. Um, and so we extended the original collection of ontologies to include uh, ontologies relating to it, experimental processes. So when you do an experiment in biology, you create data. And you create, uh, you use things like instruments, protocols, um, samples. You, you have analysis processes. You have statistical processes. And all of these things belong to the domain of OB. And the information artifacts, the data, the algorithms, the software, and so forth, belong to the information artifact ontology. And all of these things that descend from BFO. So BFO, BFO serves to unify a wide range of ontologies. <coughs> these things are used also outside biology. Um, but the primary um, examples of application of BFO are that the original ones are in the domain of domain, in various domains of biology. And um, this, these ontologies are going to be used then in other areas, as we will see. All right, so this is one example of how it works. This is the biological collections ontology. We start with BFO at the very top. You'll see what that looks like in a minute. Then we have OB which has things like material sample. And then we have, for biological collections, we have things like museum. We have an observing process. We have a selecting process. We have a submitting process. All of these things are entities, types of processes, which are involved in creating biological collections. And this is just an example of one uh, of many ontologies now, which are built in this way. And you see that by being built underneath BFO, the ontologies become combinable in a way which is uh, at least easier than it would be if they were built separately from scratch. Another point is that BFO is very well documented. Um, that, and that there, are, there is an email forum with, I think, 200 members now, which discuss how to use BFO and, and which identify problems with BFO. So there's a huge body of knowledge in the BFO community, which then means that you don't have to reinvent the methodology for doing an ontology work every time you start building a new ontology. All right, so these are the three sub-ontologies we referred to already. And this is BFO. Right, this is a the top of BFO. BFO is very small. It has 300, sorry, it has 34 nodes. And it's deliberately very small so that it's easy to teach and easy to reuse. But the top 
corresponds to the gene ontology division. So we have continuance on the one hand, which are things which continue to exist in time, such as tables, table tops, table top colors, because the color of this table top continues to exist. Um, Colors are dependent continuance, tables are independent continuance, and then we have occurrence, which are basically processes. The table doesn't really do much. It's supporting this bottle now, which is a kind of process, a very boring process. All right, so this is the BFO continuant ontology. Um, we have material entities, which are a kind of independent continuant. We have immaterial entities such as spatial regions. Uh, we have qualities, and then we have what are called realizables, which are on the one hand roles, such as my role as professor, and dispositions, such as my disposition to breathe, or to go bald, or to go gray, or to... And then as one subkind of dispositions are functions. For instance, the function of this PowerPoint gadget to move my PowerPoint deck, which is another independent continuant, uh, to the next slide. And this is the occurrent ontology, which includes processes, spatio-temporal regions, and temporal regions. And now, just a... Um, um, a uh, a note, because this will be relevant later, one kind of immaterial entity is what BFO calls a site. So this room is a site. My right nostril is a site. So sites are, um, they're not spatial regions, they are environments within which activity can take place. And they occupy spatial regions in just the same way that you and I occupy spatial, spatial regions. So the hull of a ship is a site which moves around through different spatial regions. My mouth is a site which moves around as I cross the room. There are two important kinds of sites. On the one hand, holes, for instance, my, the interior of my mouth, the interior of this room. And on the other hand, settings which are, for instance, the land area which this building is built upon, or the setting um, of, a, of a music concert. Where setting is another word for context in, in the sense of the place where something occurs. All right, so this is a picture of the mouth, and you see that the, there is a complex cavity running through your body. We'll come back to that when we deal with holes in engineering. So this is the oboe foundry. The oboe foundry is structured on the vertical dimension by granularity. We have small things such as molecules at the bottom, bigger things such as cells, very big things such as organisms, and then higher up we have things like populations species. <coughs> all boxes are odologies. Yes. Each box is an yes. odology. Yeah. And we have this book, uh, which I think some of you know about, which is a, a textbook about how to build ontologies using BFO, which came out last year with MIT Press. And I have a copy, if I could. Shall I hand it around? In case people want to. That's it. Now, there are basically three upper-level ontologies which are all are seeking to serve the same role as BFO. Um, there is Dolce, which is uh, an Italian production, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, there is Sumo, which is a kind of combination ontology. So Sumo contains some elements which I contributed, but it contains other elements which uh, extend into other areas. It's much bigger than either Dolce or BFO. BFO grew out of a collaboration with Dolce, 
Uh, it's a, it's, it, it takes a different approach than Dolce in the following sense. Dolce is focused on language and cognition. So it gives a lot of room to the entities which we think about and believe in. Where BFO is based on a much more um, real world centric approach, like the gene ontology. And so it focuses on things and the processes in which they take part. But in spite of this different focus, the two ontologies are very similar. Uh, and the, 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 there is a long standing effort to try and unify them. They are close enough that that effort is. Um, is worth pursuing. So the big difference between BFO and, and Sumo and Dolce is that BFO has many, many projects using it. So there are now something like 250 ontology initiatives which are based on BFO, including very big ones. And, uh, and so Sumo and Dolce do have projects which use them, but they, they have nothing like the use coverage that BFO has. Uh, BFO at the moment is being uh, considered to become an ISO standard top level ontology. Um, a BFO is used, it, first of all, in various biology um, ontology suite development projects, for instance, for clients. But it's also being used now for various other projects outside biology. Many projects in the military, for instance, some government projects in the US, and then the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals project. So you can find here the suite of ontologies which are being created by the United Nations for uh, uh, based on BFO and the general methodology of creating a suite of non-overlapping ontology modules. All right, so the general approach um, I described already, you have lots of data from many sources, and you have a single ontology which you use to tag the data so that it becomes interoperable, so that you can integrate it. Um, so some of you in the room I know are interested in ontology alignment. My goal is to make ontology alignment unnecessary. Um, I, it will, I will never achieve this goal because there will always be old ontologies which are left over. Uh, but gradually, more and more people, if, if this approach works, should be using ontologies developed according to this methodology so that ontology alignment is no longer necessary. Um, all right, so. What is an ontology? So according to BFO, according to Dolce, an ontology is a representation of types or universals, gen general, repeatable things. For instance, types of aircraft, types of aircraft part, types of aircraft maintenance process, and so on. All of these types have instances this particular aircraft, this particular wing of this particular aircraft. But the ontology doesn't deal with the instances. The instances are dealt with in instance databases. The ontology just deals with the types. That's the underlying idea. And notice that I never use the word concept. I just didn't use it then, I mentioned it. And if I do use the word concept, I promise to give you all a dollar, or a euro, or franc, whatever it is that you use it. Um, the word concept leads to mistakes. Uh, the more you avoid it, the more you will do good work. All right, so ontologies represent types of entities. People very often confuse the words we use with the entities or the types. And that's a, a mistake that people should be careful to avoid. People often confuse the entities with our knowledge about the entities. That's another mistake. And then people use the word concept, which is the summation of all of those mistakes. So 
Too much ontology is a bad thing because it creates new silos, and this is an example of what you get when you get too much ontology. This is anarchy. This is this is that confusion for confusion's sake. The more ontology, the better. Give me more money, and I'll build you more ontology, or I'll borrow someone else's ontology. But give it a new name. Can I ask you? A yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. If, can you give an example of this concept and why? Uh, not good to use the term concept. So the SNOMED is a very um, uh, important, influential medical quasi-ontology. Systematized nomenclature for medicine, SNOMED. Uh, it has the um, interesting quality that it has infinite funding because 15 governments have promised to pay each year each some millions of dollars for all perpetuity. Now the top most, to in, in SNOMED contains terms like disease or headache or Alzheimer's disease. The top most term in SNOMED is concept. What this means is that disease is a kind of concept. Now what that means is that to cure your headache would be a job which would be curing a concept, which is nonsense. Now we, that is to say the over foundry community, um, have been arguing with SNOMED for years. We say this is a confusion. A headache is not a concept. And so finally, a couple of years ago, they inclu included a warning which says basically, we realize the term concept is a confusing term and what we mean by concept is one of three things either a concept code or I've forgotten the other two but an idea in the mind of somebody or something else so even SNOMED understands that concept is a bad word but still they have what they call a concept model I never used the word concept at any point in saying all of it Thanks. If you want me to continue with this yes. so one, yes. one, one of the, let's say, most common definitions of knowledge that we are using says that the knowledge is a shared conceptualization. Yes, yeah. that, that is it's an expression which comes from Tom Gruber. Yeah. Now, I think Tom Gruber was innocent. Okay. I do not believe that he was confused. The problem is, so a, an, a, to use Tom Gruber's words, an ontology is a representation of a conceptualization. But it's not a representation concepts. of concepts. It's a representation of, of a conceptualization of reality. Mm -hmm. Restaurants, movies, traffic. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that whenever a human being thinks about traffic, they use a certain conceptualization. You capture that conceptualization in an ontology. The ontology and the conceptualization and the representation are about cars the type car, truck, road, bridge, traffic light, policeman, and so on. They are all types in reality. Now what happened was that, the, 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 let's assume that Tom Gruber was a good guy. So the good guys understand representations in that way. But then the knowledge representation community wants to represent not traffic, but our knowledge of traffic. Mm -hmm. And so they start talking about ontologies as representations of knowledge. Mm -hmm. That's a mistake. Mm -hmm. to, in order to cure a headache, it's not good enough to cure the knowledge, the knowledge of a headache. In fact, it's a confusion to even want to cure the knowledge of a headache. So, mm -hmm. I rest my case. <laughs> okay. So, yes? Sorry for the stupid question, but... Um, I'm used to um, call the classes of an ontology yep. concepts. Yeah, it's very easy. You just start doing that. I would that. change this. Yeah. Or you pay me a dollar every time you do it. <laughs> <laughs> but so we, we should change this this, this habit. Yeah, this it's, a it's a confusion. It's a confusion. I mean, you yeah. never find it in the gene ontology. They will never ever say that uh, that a, a cell is a concept. The gene ontology did make one big parallel mistake. Uh, which I, I, I helped them fix very quickly. 
uh, in the original version of the gene ontology, the topmost node of gene ontology was gene ontology. So a cell is a gene ontology. Mm-hmm. Now that's just a mistake. But a cell is a concept. is is also a mistake. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can you can say gene ontolo- ontology entity was whatever is that would be better. But in fact, they just have the top node ce- a cellular component, and then a cell is a cellular component, the maximal cellular. Component. But again, to, to jump back to the previous topic, um, from a very practical point of view, when you start working with Protege, for example, yeah. it's a very useful tool for modeling ontologies. Uh, well, in, in the manual, you could see that they say, okay, create new concepts. So, yeah. create new concepts. <laughs> so, and in the, in the, concepts in the Protege is- tutorial, they're talking <laughs> about creating a new pizza. <laughs> but by yes. by entering a term in Protégé, I don't know, vaudois pizza, mm-hmm. you don't create a pizza. Mm-hmm. You create a term. And you should, that's how you should view it. Okay. That's how the gene ontology views it. So it's better to use, let's say, the concept class or type to define. Class is better than concept. Type universal. So the, in fact, I've been talking about types. There are two kinds of general entities which an ontology in BFO terms represents. On the one hand, there are types, for instance, the type car or the type chair or the type mammal. And then on the other hand, there are what we call defined classes. Mm-hmm. And defined classes are used when there are no entities which are extra entities. So there is, if you are, you are a human being, so there is a type human being. You are also a professor. Mm-hmm. But your, the, the professor Kiritsis is not a second entity in addition to the human being. But it's useful to talk about all the professors in Lausanne, for instance. Mm-hmm. That would be a defined class. It's not a type, it's a defined class. And we, we have a definition. X is a professor in Lausanne, if and only if, X is a human being who has a professor role and who is in Lausanne. And then the professor role is an extra entity. And there is a type professor role. And instances of that professor role are Dimitris's professor role, my professor role, and so on. I'll talk about that uh, in a minute. Yes? Yeah, coming from the, the IT, because of so yeah. This, the, um, the, there is a way to, uh, when you approach an, I- an issue or problem, when you want to develop a database, then you use object-oriented programming. Yeah. And I see a, a lot of similarities, like with the classes and the yeah. object instantiation. Yeah. Is, is that kind of related? It's related, but it, 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 again, there are some uh, areas where people get confused. So they think they're doing object-oriented programming when they're doing ontologies, or they think they're doing ontology when they're doing ontology, uh, object-oriented programming. So it's good to understand the similarities. Uh, it's good to understand the differences. So one similarity is that for both um, single inheritance is a, a good thing to aim for. Uh, so the gene ontology aims for single inheritance. It doesn't achieve it completely but it aims for single inheritance. And that's a, one of our recommendations, that the good ontology will have a single node and there will be a uni- unique, mm-hmm. uh, superordinate node for every node in the ontology so that you get the true tree in the mathematical system. So if we want to make it a more vul- vulgarization on, um, on this, can we uh, say that ontology is um, a classification, a formal classification language that describes the types and the, cla- and the classes of, uh, I mean, of objects. So every ontology contains a backbone. Uh, uh, so according to the view I propagate, every ontology should contain a backbone, single inheritance taxonomy. And then, in addition, the ontology will have other relations. For instance, part of, which connect the nodes horizontally around the backbone taxonomy. So your idea is actually pointing in exactly the right direction. Okay, to make it specific, so it, there is um, a characterization of a single inheritance. Yeah, okay. yeah, that's and the then, goal. And the goal. all the other type of relations are uh, parts of or belonging of. Yeah, yeah. 
So there are multiple yeah. other types of relations. And we have a relation ontology which is designed to catalogue those multiple types of relations. Any more questions? Okay, so I'll do a few more minutes and then we'll break. Just, uh, yeah. You have a question? Yes, it would, in what, let's say, context, I don't know how to say that, it would be fair to use the term concept. Never. 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 <laughs> so if you're doing psychology, the psychology of learning how to categorize or to classify the entities in your environment, it's, it's acceptable to use the word concept. Mm -hmm. Um, so there is, there is a, a quite serious adult subdiscipline of psychology which, has, which uses the word concept in a correct way. Mm -hmm. But we're not doing psychology here. We're, the whole point of ontology is that it is designed to address the fact that different groups have different conceptualizations mm -hmm. by creating a common benchmark classification which can be used to make all of these mutually, uh, independently developed conceptualizations interoperable with each other. But uh, I'm, a, I'm a human being, yeah? so I'm Yeah, thinking, so I'm sorry. No problem, yeah, thank you. <laughs> and w when I, I'm a designer, I'm an engineer, I'm a designer. Yeah. And I'm designing a washing machine. Yeah. And in the washing machine, when I'm thinking, so I think that I need a, uh, a motor. Yeah. When I do this, I'm thinking about the motor. Yeah. I need the motor. Yeah. In my mind, this motor, I have the concept of a motor. What I have? So you know that there are motors. There is a universal motor yeah, which you understand very well, and so you yeah. want to either pick out an already existing motor or you want to create example, yes. a new kind of motor. Yeah. I said all of that without using this damn word concept. What is this in my mind that I think I, I'm thinking about the motor? What is this? This is a universal? This so is a to work out are you out doing psychology course. now or are you doing no, no, engineering? No, no, to, to <laughs> <laughs> Let's do engineering. It's out there. Yeah, there are motors out there. Yeah, yeah, but for me all of this starts from our minds when, when yeah. we're thinking about okay, well, processes, etc. That's just your own private concern. You okay. stop worrying about it. <laughs> okay, so Unless you're doing psychology, then no, it's no, fine. No, no, I don't want to do psychology, but... Uh, yeah. <coughs> Just I'm thinking, yeah, I have that's, that's, notions, let's yeah. say, in my mind, yeah. and then when I go to, let's say, modeling course, creating structures, yeah. about all that, I use terms like classes, entities, and this. Yeah. Kind of so let me I think understand you, because I mean, the starting point for me also is the concepts. This is mm -hmm. where the things derive from. You owe me a dollar. <laughs> um, so yeah. let me get me, uh, let me meet you halfway. Okay. Um, when you are developing an ontology using the buffo approach, you're focusing always on what exists in reality, including in people's minds, if yeah. you're doing the ontology of psychology. Um, but when you're doing planning or designing or predictive something, uh, futurism, it may very well be that you are thinking about things which do not exist. Mm -hmm. And so the Dolce people will say, oh, this is, this is something for us. Mm -hmm. All of these non-existent things uh, are the, the, something which Dolce is, is deliberately designed for. The problem is that then Dolce ends up with far too many non-existent things. So your 47th daughter, for instance, is an object, an entity in Dolce land. I don't have any of I know, but the, that Dolce can help you there. So that <laughs> you have a possible 47th daughter. You may be planning to have many daughters. Okay. And then Dolce would come in and say, yeah, we have room for your 47th daughter and for your 48th daughter and for your 48 billion and third daughter, which I think is going too far. And so what I would say is, and this is um, the, a confession of weakness now, this is not terribly sophisticated yet. We're working on the ontology of planning at the moment, trying to make this more formal or more rigorous. But roughly what I would say is that you can't think about future entities without thinking about them in terms which relate to existing entities now. So daughters exist. The number 47 exists. Mm -hmm. 
people having multiple daughters is a phenomenon which exists. And so when you think about your 47th daughter, you're thinking about the universal daughter, the universal birth, the universal mother, and so on. And you're just putting them together in a new way. And similarly, when you're thinking about a new motor, you're, you're thinking about motors which exist already, and you're thinking about functions of motors which exist already. You're thinking about putting those elements together in new combinations. And so BFO can still work even when you're thinking about the future, about planning, about design, and so forth. But I agree that this is the weakest aspect of BFO. BFO is very much focused on the yeah. real world yeah. rather than on fantasy, mm -hmm. where Dolce is really good when it comes to science mythology fiction. and science fiction and so forth. Um, I don't think that speaks in favor of Dolce, but I'm willing to confess that that is an advantage that they have. Okay. I'm sorry to ask maybe a last question about concept, because if I want to... <laughs> you owe me a dollar. To win, uh, <laughs> no, no. Unless you say about design. concept. For conceptual design. Yes, I don't know what that is. It's about design. Okay, design is good. Design, design is good. For yeah. If I don't use the, the word concept, then we have problems when I will uh, work okay, good. the databases. Yeah. So if you're doing your work in your design lab mm -hmm. and you're talking to other designers, it's perfectly harmless for you to say, well, what, what is the concept underlying this design? And it means idea or goal or objective or purpose. That's fine. BFO needs to be able to deal with all of those things. And we are working on it. So it, the OB ontology for biomedical investigations has um, objective specification as one of its terms. Uh, and I think that that would be in the area that you are working in when you talk about conceptual design. So I don't have anything against conceptual design. I think that's a wonderful thing. I'm just trying to get people to realize that using the word concept when doing ontology has been shown to lead to uh, confusions and, and errors.